What if I told you that the most decisive weapon of World War II wasn't a bomb, a tank, or even an airplane, but invisible waves bouncing through the sky? For 11 days in early 1942, Japanese aircraft ruled the skies over the Pacific with near impunity. American forces scrambled in darkness, fighting blind against an enemy they couldn't see coming. Then everything changed. Not because of superior firepower or braver soldiers, but because of a technology so revolutionary that it transformed the very nature of warfare itself. This is the story of how radar, a device most people had never heard of, turned the tide of the Pacific War and exposed every secret move Japan tried to make. The technology that saved countless American lives and ultimately helped win the war began as a scientific curiosity in laboratories far from any battlefield. But when Japanese bombers descended on Allied positions with devastating precision, when American fighters took off too late and returned with empty fuel tanks and heavy hearts, military leaders realized that seeing the enemy before they arrived wasn't just an advantage, it was survival. What followed was one of the most dramatic technological races in military history, where physics met desperation and where invisible beams of energy became the difference between victory and annihilation. December 7, 1941, marked more than just the attack on Pearl Harbor. It inaugurated a new era of Pacific warfare, where Japan's mastery of carrier-based aviation gave them seemingly unstoppable momentum. Within hours of Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces struck the Philippines, devastating American air power on the ground at Clark Field. Within days, they had attacked Wake Island, Guam, Hong Kong, and Malaya. The speed and coordination were breathtaking. American commanders faced a terrifying reality. Japanese aircraft appeared without warning, struck with precision, and vanished before effective response could be mounted. The traditional methods of air defense, visual spotting and acoustic detection, proved catastrophically inadequate against modern aircraft traveling at hundreds of miles per hour. By the time spotters saw enemy planes and relayed information through communication chains, those aircraft had already dropped their bombs and begun their return journey. The Americans were fighting a 20th century war with 19th century detection methods. Ground observers squinted at horizons. Acoustic mirrors, large concrete structures designed to amplify engine sounds, proved useless against the roar of battle and the velocity of modern warplanes. During those first 11 days after Pearl Harbor, the pattern repeated across the Pacific with grim regularity. Japanese strike forces approached undetected. Anti-aircraft batteries opened fire only after bombs were falling. Fighter aircraft scrambled too late, climbing desperately toward enemies already departing. American casualties mounted not primarily from inferior equipment or training, but from a fundamental information deficit. The Japanese could see the battlefield through reconnaissance. The Americans were effectively blind until the enemy was directly overhead. This asymmetry was unsustainable. Something had to change, or the Pacific would be lost before America could fully mobilize its industrial might. The story of radar begins not in military laboratories, but in the realm of pure scientific inquiry. In 1886, German physicist Heinrich Hertz demonstrated that electromagnetic waves could be reflected by metallic objects, a discovery with no apparent military application. For decades, this remained a curiosity discussed in academic papers. In the 1930s, however, multiple nations independently realized that radio waves could detect distant objects by measuring the time delay of reflected signals. The British, facing the threat of German bombers, invested heavily in this radio detection and ranging technology, radar. American radar development accelerated dramatically in the late 1930s, driven by the Naval Research Laboratory and the Army Signal Corps. Early systems were primitive, bulky, unreliable, and difficult to operate. The SCR-270 radar, which would play a crucial role at Pearl Harbor, required a truck to transport and took hours to set up. Its cathode ray tube display showed barely interpretable blips. Operators needed extensive training to distinguish actual aircraft from ground clutter, weather phenomena, or equipment malfunction. The technology existed, but it remained immature, unproven in combat, and unfamiliar to most military personnel. Ironically, radar provided the earliest warning of the Pearl Harbor attack, and that warning was ignored. At 7.02 a.m. on December 7th, two Army radar operators at Opana Point detected a large formation of aircraft approaching from the north, 132 miles distant. 
they reported this contact to the information center, where a junior officer dismissed it as either a malfunction or American B-17 bombers expected from the mainland. This failure wasn't technological, but organizational. The military establishment hadn't yet integrated radar into operational doctrine. The machine worked perfectly. The human systems surrounding it failed catastrophically. This failure paradoxically became radar's salvation. After Pearl Harbor, skepticism evaporated. The fact that radar had detected the Japanese attack and that the warning had been disregarded proved both the technology's potential and the urgent need to deploy it properly. Within weeks, radar installations were being rushed to every strategic location across the Pacific. The technology that had been a promising experiment became an absolute priority. But the Japanese didn't know this. They had achieved their initial objectives with such devastating success that they believed American defenses remained blind. This assumption would prove fatal. Radar represented something fundamentally new in warfare, the ability to see beyond the horizon through darkness, fog and clouds. Previous detection methods relied on direct observation. You saw the enemy or you didn't. Radar created an extended sensory field, a technological vision that transcended human limitations. A radar installation could detect aircraft 100 miles away, providing 20 minutes or more of warning. This was revolutionary. 20 minutes meant fighters could reach altitude, anti-aircraft batteries could train their guns, civilians could reach shelters. The element of surprise, Japan's greatest tactical advantage, began to evaporate. The implications extended far beyond simple early warning. Radar enabled vectoring, directing fighter aircraft toward enemy formations with precision. Before radar, fighters patrolled blind, hoping to spot the enemy visually. With radar, ground controllers could watch both friendly and enemy aircraft simultaneously, providing real-time guidance to intercept points. This transformed air defense from a reactive scramble into a coordinated system. American fighters, often inferior in maneuverability to Japanese Zeros, could now choose when and where to engage, attacking from advantageous positions with energy advantage. The technological edge compensated for tactical disadvantages, but radar's greatest contribution was psychological and strategic. The Japanese had built their Pacific strategy around rapid, overwhelming strikes that paralyzed enemy response. When those strikes began failing, when American fighters were already airborne and waiting, when anti-aircraft fire began the moment bombers came within range, Japanese commanders faced a crisis of understanding. How were the Americans tracking them? Were there spies? Had communications been compromised? The possibility that invisible radio waves were revealing their every move seemed nearly supernatural to many Japanese pilots. This uncertainty bred caution. Caution slowed operations. Slowed operations surrendered initiative. The development of airborne radar took these advantages further. Mounted in aircraft, radar enabled night fighting and all-weather interception. Japanese forces, masters of daytime carrier operations, had no answer to radar-equipped American night fighters that could track and destroy enemy bombers in complete darkness. The night, traditionally a refuge for attackers, became a killing field for defenders with technological vision. The fundamental equation of air warfare had reversed. Attackers were now at disadvantage against prepared defenders with radar warning. The integration of radar into Pacific operations required more than just installing equipment. It demanded completely reimagining defensive doctrine. The military established fighter direction centers, sophisticated facilities where radar operators, communications specialists, and tactical directors worked in coordinated teams. These centers became the nervous system of air defense, ingesting information from multiple radar installations, filtering false contacts, identifying threats, and vectoring responses. For the first time, air defense operated as a true system rather than a collection of individual units acting independently. The Battle of Midway in June 1942 demonstrated radar's strategic value decisively. American radar provided early warning of Japanese airstrikes, allowing Admiral Nimitz to launch his own strike aircraft before the enemy attack arrived. Japanese carriers, caught with aircraft on deck being refueled and rearmed, were devastated. While Midway's outcome depended on many factors, intelligence, courage, and fortune among them, radar provided the tactical flexibility that turned strategic intelligence into operational success. The Americans could see the battlefield, the Japanese could not. 
That asymmetry proved decisive. As 1942 progressed, radar networks expanded across the Pacific. The Guadalcanal campaign, beginning in August, showcased radar's value in sustained defensive operations. Japanese aircraft, attempting nightly bombardment runs down the slot, found American fighters waiting in the darkness, guided by radar stations on the ground. The Tokyo Express supply runs, previously conducted with relative impunity, became increasingly costly as radar-directed PT boats and aircraft intercepted them. The Japanese maintained their tactical skill and operational courage, but they were fighting an enemy who could see them coming from distances they couldn't counter. The Americans also deployed radar picket ships, destroyers equipped with powerful radar installations positioned beyond the fleet to provide extended early warning. These vessels, often operating alone in dangerous waters, became the outer ring of fleet defense. During the massive carrier battles of 1944, the Philippine Sea and Leyte Gulf, radar pickets provided the critical minutes of warning that allowed combat air patrols to intercept Japanese strikes far from the carriers. The Japanese strategy of overwhelming American defenses through sheer numbers, founded against a defense that could track every aircraft, allocate interceptors efficiently, and maintain continuous awareness of the tactical situation. The radar revolution raises profound questions about technology's role in warfare. Did radar make war more humane by enabling more efficient defense, potentially reducing casualties on both sides? Or did it simply escalate the technological arms race, forcing nations to invest ever more resources into offensive and defensive systems? The Japanese response to American radar was to develop their own radar systems, improve low-altitude attack profiles to evade detection, and attempt electronic countermeasures. Each defensive innovation prompted offensive counter-innovation, creating a spiral of technological development that consumed enormous resources and intellectual capital. There's also a troubling moral dimension to information superiority. Radar gave American forces what amounted to an invisible advantage. Japanese pilots flew into battles they didn't realize were already lost, facing enemies who could see them while they remained blind. While this saved American lives, it also created a profound asymmetry that some historians argue made the Pacific War unnecessarily prolonged. If Japanese commanders had fully understood the extent of American radar capabilities earlier, might they have pursued negotiated settlement sooner? Conversely, American confidence derived partly from technological superiority, a confidence that sometimes led to operational risks and casualties that better intelligence sharing might have prevented. The radar story also illuminates the often neglected role of scientists and engineers in military victory. While generals and admirals received public recognition, thousands of physicists, electrical engineers, and technicians worked in obscurity, developing, deploying, and maintaining radar systems. These were not soldiers trained for combat, but civilians in uniform, applying scientific principles to military problems. Their contribution was as essential as any infantry advance or naval engagement, yet remains less celebrated in popular memory. This raises questions about how we understand and commemorate military achievement. Is the focus on combat valor appropriate, or should technological innovation receive equal recognition? Furthermore, the radar revolution demonstrates the dangers of tactical success breeding strategic blindness. Japan's early victories in the Pacific came so easily that they failed to recognize the fundamental vulnerability in their approach. They were winning battles with methods that couldn't scale or adapt to an enemy learning from defeat. American forces, stung by early losses, invested desperately in force multipliers like radar. The Japanese, winning consistently, saw less urgency in technological development. By the time Japanese commanders recognized the problem, the gap had become unbridgeable. Success paradoxically became the foundation of ultimate failure, a lesson with implications far beyond World War II. Those 11 days of Japanese air supremacy after Pearl Harbor represented both the zenith of their early Pacific campaign and the beginning of its inevitable decline. The very completeness of their initial victories obscured the revolution occurring in American defensive technology. While Japanese pilots celebrated their dominance, radar installations were multiplying across the Pacific like electronic sentinels, creating an invisible web of detection that would strangle Japanese offensive operations. By war's end, radar had evolved far beyond early warning. It guided anti-aircraft fire with deadly precision, 
It enabled blind bombing through clouds and darkness. It detected surfaced submarines and guided torpedoes to their targets. The technology that began as a way to see enemy aircraft became integral to nearly every aspect of modern warfare. Today's militaries are unimaginable without radar and its descendants, from air traffic control to missile guidance to weather forecasting. The technology born from desperate necessity reshaped civilization itself. The human cost behind these technological achievements demands recognition. Radar operators worked marathon shifts in sweltering tropical heat or freezing conditions, staring at flickering screens until their eyes ached, knowing that missed contacts meant death for their comrades. Engineers improvised repairs with inadequate tools and parts in remote jungle outposts. Scientists worked themselves to exhaustion-solving problems that had no textbook solutions. Their names appear in no history books. Their faces grace no monuments. Yet their contributions saved thousands of lives and shortened the war by months, perhaps years. What remains most striking about the radar revolution is how invisible it was to contemporary observers. The decisive weapon of the Pacific War left no dramatic visual evidence, no mushroom clouds, no burning ships, no destroyed cities. It was silent, invisible, and absolutely essential. Soldiers on both sides could see fighters intercepting bombers, anti-aircraft fire-finding targets, but they couldn't see the technological infrastructure making those successes possible. Victory appeared conventional, achieved through familiar means, when in reality it rested on a foundation of physics and engineering that transformed warfare as profoundly as gunpowder had centuries earlier. The Japanese entered World War II as masters of carrier aviation and tactical air operations. They lost that war not primarily because of inferior pilots or aircraft, but because they fought an enemy who could see them coming. Radar didn't win the Pacific War alone. No single technology ever does. But it transformed every battle, every operation, every strategic calculation. It changed what was possible in naval warfare, creating advantages that material superiority alone couldn't guarantee. The Americans didn't just outproduce Japan. They outsmarted them developing force multipliers that made every ship more effective, every fighter more lethal, every defensive position more secure. Today, we live in a world where radar is ubiquitous and unremarkable, tracking commercial aircraft, measuring vehicle speed, predicting weather patterns. It's become so ordinary that we forget its revolutionary origins. But for 11 days in December 1941, the Pacific War hung in the balance won or lost based on whether technology could adapt faster than the enemy could exploit success. Radar tipped that balance. It gave eyes to the blind, revealing enemy movements that human senses could never detect. And in doing so, it demonstrated a truth that remains relevant today. In modern warfare, information isn't just an advantage. It's the difference between triumph and catastrophe. The side that sees clearly, that processes information faster, that turns data into decisive action will prevail regardless of raw material superiority. Japan had air supremacy for 11 days, then radar ensured they would never have it again. That invisible revolution, fought in laboratories and control centers rather than in the sky, determined the outcome of the war as surely as any battle. And the lessons it taught about adaptation, about the value of scientific investment, about the power of seeing what your enemy cannot echo through military doctrine to this very day. The war was won by brave soldiers and sailors, but they fought with eyes provided by science, and those eyes made all the difference. 